Amen. We in part two of a series on margin, how to balance your resources and your responsibilities. And as all my family coming in, who was free before 11, but you got to pay now. We're going to give y'all to warm y'all up and let people find their seat some mimosa music, some Sunday brunch mimosa music. We are Zion Music. Hit him with the theme music. Hey. Hey. <laughs> ah, Brian Wilson. Hit him with it. They ain't found their seats yet. So Brian Wilson, take them back to it. Can y'all sing it? Hit it, don't push it, don't push it. Yeah, all my tired people. All my people that's close to the edge. All my people that's like, don't play with me right now. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Don't leave, leave me alone. Back up. Watch your mouth with the F on it. Watch your mouth. <laughs> Watch your mouth. Hey, you ever had a kid and you disrespect and you follow the kid? Like, say it, say it, <laughs> say it. You know you're too close to the edge and you follow your kid around, I dare you. I do. what you say? what you say? Amen. I'm preaching to everybody here who's close to the edge. All right, Matthew chapter 11, if you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to use the Good News translation today. I'm going to focus on verses 28 to 30. And if you are physically able to stand and you want to look along with me in some kind of Bible device, manual, digital, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Hey, while you're standing, uh, please just tell, tell two people, say good morning, just good morning to two people. Actually, what time is it? Hey, mistake, where we are right here on the East Coast, it's now afternoon. So do me a favor now, type it in the chat. Say to somebody, Zion Fort Washington, Zion Land over, everybody, two people. Good afternoon. <laughs> hey, look, and hey, you know what else you can say? I just spoke to you this morning. This is, this is, this is, this is, hey. Amen. Matthew chapter 11. I see you, Pastor. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Says this: Come to me, all of you who are tired. Ooh. Ooh, I can't get past that word. Anybody here tired from carrying heavy loads? It means you got a lot on you. How many people listen to me know what it's like to have a lot on you? In the past, I got a lot on me. Sometimes you got a lot on you. People can't see it, but it's still on you. And when you got a lot on you, it can break you. Or it can make you break something. Or it can make you break somebody. You, you, you've heard that statement, um, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back? Yeah. Think about that for a minute. If a straw can break a camel's back, there had to be a lot on that camel before the straw got to it. And I'm saying, somebody listen to me, you one straw from breaking. Don't push me. I'm carrying something heavy. Jesus says, come to me like that, and I will give you what? Oh, my God. Rest. Rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke and put it on you. Lord, help me not to forget to talk about that. And learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find there it is again. What will you find? Who knew God wanted me to get 
rest. In the world that is competing and making idols out of work and grind all the time and team no sleep, God said, the God who made us said, I want you to have, to, I want to give you rest and I want you to find it. Mm. Verse 30, for the yoke I give you is easy and the load I'll put on you is light. Ooh, you may be seated. When you talk about margin, margin is, how about my new, how about my new prop this week, y'all? They ain't playing no games this week. <laughs> Say, jump on that. <laughs> I'm scared to touch it, man. It's kind of a little heavy, too. But, but margin is this, this, this juggling act between my responsibilities and my resources. Every responsibility requires a resource. If it is a responsibility, it must be. If the responsibility is work, then I need time. If responsibility is a job, an assignment, I need skills and knowledge. If the responsibility is a bill, I need money. You understand what I'm saying? So, so the juggling act is this. How do, I, how do I make sure that my responsibilities are always below my resources? That's margin. That space is margin. It is a space for grace. It is a space to smell the roses. It is a space to chill out. It is a space to watch your children grow up. Instead of having to say, they grew up so fast, I miss, it's just like it was just yesterday. Some of us have missed everything, so many important things because we were living without margin. We weren't even paying attention. I had my head down trying to make it happen, trying to keep up with all these responsibilities. So I, I only have a limited amount of skills, a limited amount of time, a limited amount of physical energy, a limited amount of support system, a limited amount of training, and I got to meet all of my problems and all of my, I got school, I got deadlines, I got work, I got a parent, I got expectations from people, I got expectations from others, I got obligations and commitments. All of that must be met by a limited amount of resources. So, so when, whenever you your load, your responsibilities, is equal to your limit or your resources when it's just equal. Even if it comes out, zero balances out, that still means you're living without margin. I have no room for error. So not only am I close to the edge, but I'm tiptoeing on the precipice of any moment being bumped over into something and fall down into God knows what. And then many of us are far beyond just bringing... The goal is not to bring my responsibilities right up to my resources. The goal is to live with some space. It's called a budget. You have to budget your life and your schedule too. So just because you got a raise, that means you're supposed to upgrade your car. Like maybe the raise was margin. So we can breathe a little and don't have to dodge creditors. Like, oh, y'all didn't like that part. See, whenever somebody is upside down like that and you have more responsibilities than you have resources or you have more load than you have limits, that means, financially speaking, that means you're living, you're, financially when it's like that, when you have more bills than money, more bills than income, that means you're living in the red. You're, you're, you're in the red. That means you're, you're upside down. That means you're going to get notices from the bank saying insufficient funds, um, uh, what, uh, uh, what's, what's it called? Uh, uh, when you get fees from overdrafts, that's a fee. It's not only, not only did I not have enough to pay the bill, but then I got to pay some more for the bad check that I wrote. So it got bad. It, that's a stressful way to operate financially. And I'm saying some of us aren't just operating financially like that. Our life is in the red. So, so watch this. I got insufficient physical strength. I got insufficient spiritual strength. I got insufficient energy. I got insufficient knowledge. But I'm taking on all these obligations and responsibilities. And then what happens is it tires you out. It exhausts you. It pushes you to the limits. And most people who feel that way are, used, are secretly not only tired, but they're secretly mad too. People who overcommit themselves and are overtaxed in so many areas are usually mad at people who are not overwhelmed and overloaded. So we get mad at people who are relaxing and living their life with wisdom. And then we're mad at people who don't help us do the stuff that we shouldn't be doing anyway. 
So we mad at them because they won't help. So you plan the Thanksgiving dinner. You plan the hosting. You plan to do all that stuff. When somebody says, do you need me to? Nah, I got it. And since you said you got it, now everybody watching the game with their feet up and you're the only one cleaning. Now you mad. Well, you said you got it. <laughs> Nobody told you to do all that. So you mad, and now, here's the, here's, the, here's the dangerous thing about it. It is the impact that this stuff has on us health-wise. Because instead of us, when, how many of you can understand what I'm saying so far? So what's this, here's the deal. Instead of us addressing the overcommitments, instead of us addressing the real problem that is overcommitments, what we do instead is we try to stretch the resources. Don't miss that. This is so important. So instead of dealing with the fact, you know what? I said yes to too many things. Instead, what I try to do is to stress the resource. You know what? I'm going to wake up earlier and I'm going to go to sleep later and I'm going to grind a little harder and I'm working a little harder. And that's costing you too. Now that's costing you more of your physical energy. It's costing you more of your mental health. It's costing you more of your physical health. And, and, and people who live like that are, 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 are headed towards medical episodes. Medical episodes like strokes and heart attacks for a long time were considered something that only happened to elderly people. But the science and the research is showing that more and more people are having strokes in their middle age, in their 40s, in their 30s. Even people that are young adults are starting to be, are starting to show up. The, the, the stats are going up. The 15 and 19, they have now stats on 15 and 19 year olds having heart attacks. This is unprecedented because it's affecting young people too. This being overtaxed. Because a lot of us aren't concerned. We, we just think, oh, he's talking about margin. This is for us old people with responsibilities. Let me tell you something. A lot of young people are close to the edge too. And the reason why they're close to the edge is for the same reason. They, they got more responsibilities than they have resources. So they have limited resources, and we know they have limited resources. They, they don't know everything at 16 years old, even though every 16-year-old thinks they know more than their parents. They think they're a walking encyclopedia, but we know they don't have all the knowledge that they need and they're going to need in their life. They don't have all the financial strength that they need in life. They got limited resources just by virtue of their age. But a lot of them have a ton of responsibilities. They got academic responsibilities. They got athletic responsibilities if they're on a team. They got artistic responsibilities if they compete in dance or they're, they're uh, in acting or they play an instrument. They got social pressure on them. You ain't had sex yet? They got, they got fashion pressure on them. Look at you dressing like a bama. If they don't have enough money or their parents don't have enough money to put them in designer clothes, they got that pressure on them. They got, they got, they got pressure on their body image. They got all all this pressure on them and many of our teenagers are overloaded and they're overwhelmed and we don't even pay attention to it. The fact that they're just as stressed out as we are. And what we did, that's, that's real. And what we need to do is create environments in our house where we're protecting them by doing, this is what we need in our house. We need to do less. Stop doing so much. Look at somebody wherever you're sitting right now. I want you to look at at least one person and say, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. Less is more. And the impact of busyness on our families is killing us. We're isolated. It's tearing us apart. We don't eat together. We don't watch television together. We don't talk to each other. Everybody's isolated. Everybody's managing their life on their own and it's killing us. And our busyness has gotten us the things that we wanted, but it's costing us the things that matter most. If you know I'm telling the truth, do something. Say something. This is a problem, y'all, and it's epidemic. And here's the thing. It is impacting our health in a way. Listen to some of the challenges that young people have. These are, these are not, by the way, when I talk about these medical issues, I'm not saying that margin is the only contributor to medical episodes. It is also true that the sedentary lifestyles and, and, and uh, poor uh, eating habits is contributing to it and high levels of ongoing stress. I get that. But if you connect it, all that's tethered to, to a lack of margin. Because if I don't have enough time to cook food and eat healthy, then I'm going to do carry out. And I'm going to do carry out all the time. And then if you, don't, if you catch me in the wrong, I might eat out the vending machine which I know is processed food. 
That's what you do when you don't have margin. You got to just grab anything. You just grab anything, man. I just want something to eat. Just grab whatever you got. That is a life that is not with a margin. So you talk about sedentary. Of course, there's a sedentary lifestyle, but I want to connect it to a lack of margin. The sedentary nature of our children is collected to, is collected to a lack of margin in the parents. Let me prove it to you. When I was younger, and I'm not trying to pit one generation against another, I'm just going to give you facts. When I was younger, we played outside. That's how we played. We played hopscotch. We played freeze tag. We played hot bread and butter. We played mother may I. We played throw a football. We played touch. We played tag. We pl- Everything was outside. You'd be outside till you smelt like outside. <laughs> you just smell like outside. You had to be because if you came back in the house, your mother say you can't go back out. So I just, be, I just pee on myself. I ain't going back in the house. Just, you're just going because we're going to stay out here. Now, the parents don't even want the children to play outside, not simply because it's unsafe, but because the parent wants the child to play on their tablet because as you play on your tablet, I get to work on mine because I don't have three hours to sit and watch you play. I need those three hours to catch up on my email and to catch up on my projects because you know I not only got a full-time job, but I got a side hustle. I cornrow hair, I detail cars, I sell Amway. I, you know, I got all this. So you got nine businesses, ain't none of them materializing, but you got all these businesses. So while your child really wants to go outside and play on the playground, you say, where's your tablet? Y'all ain't ready for me today. Where's your tablet? Well, you want them on the tablet so you don't have to look. You you don't want to watch them or go play with them. And I'm saying, that's the world we live in. So now we got children who are so used to seeing their parents go, 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 go. And all things, everything is so stressed and anxious. Listen to some of these medical conditions. Anxiety disorders. Children. Anxiety disorders. Panic attacks. PTSD, children, depression, di- difficulty concentrating, cardiovascular disease. How you, high, how you got high blood pressure? You're 20. This is real stuff. And not all of it's genetic. Some of it is literally the lack of balance in our lives. Car- uh, digestive problems. Young people with ulcers. This is stuff that used to be, you had to be old to get this kind of stuff. Insomnia, which brings about impaired cognitive function, immune system disorders, allergies, autoimmune disorders, skin conditions, eczema, breaking out in acne, hives. All of this is all formed out of a place of busyness. And I think busyness is killing us. And it's our responsibility. Let me tell you something. It is nobody's responsibility to capture margin in your life but you. It is your responsibility to regain control. And we got to say, we're going to do less. We're going to do less and we're going to do more together. So I come to this passage in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, which is screaming, I want you to have margin. How do you know that, Pastor Battle? Because he said, the yoke he has for me is easy. And the burden he has for me is like, if you are not having it easy and light, you got a yoke on you that didn't come from him. See, now we got to have a conversation. We're going to have to have a face-to-face. Now, whose yoke is this? Is this a yoke of society and the American dream that tells me this is what I got to get to? When is enough enough? I got three jobs. When is enough enough? And I'm saying maybe God's yoke is, not maybe, God says my yoke is easy, my burden is light, you got a heavy burden, you got a hard task, and I didn't give you all that. And the first three words in verse 28 just bless me so much because Jesus says to tired people, exhausted people, people with heavy things on them, that got a lot on them. He says three, look at the first three words. He says, come to me. Mm. Come to me. What an invitation. Jesus says, come to me. It is so personal. It is so loving. 
It's an invitation to intimacy. It is different. Many times in the scriptures, he says, follow me to his disciples. Just follow me, follow me. That's different. That's important. Follow me. But if I tell you to follow me and you need direction somewhere because you don't know where you're going and I say, I can show you how to get there. If I say, follow me, we don't have to be close for you to follow me. You just got to keep your eye on me. Yeah, just keep your eye on me. If I go this way, you go this way. If I go this way, you go. But we don't have to be close. But if I say, come to me, that means I'm looking at you. When Jesus says, come to me, that means he's got his eyes on you. That means he wants you. Like his, it's, like, it's like a grandparent when that grandchild comes in. Where my grandparents at? When them things come in the room, I don't even call them people. They things. When them grandchildren come in the room, you don't care nothing about their parents. Hey, baby, how you doing? Get out of the way. You go find something to do. Yeah, thank you for bringing the child here. Thank you. That's how Jesus is with us. Come, come to me. Come to me. Baby, come to me. Let me put my arms around you. I just, that just came to me. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes for a second. And I want you, here's what I want you to picture. I want you to picture Jesus in front of you with his, his hands and arms extended to you. Who? You see him? And he's not just tolerating you. He welcomes you with your tired soul. With your tired, exhausted soul. And do you know what he's going to do when you get to him? <sighs> Some of you could use a God hug. And I want you to lift your head back up. But I want you to remember that that invitation from the Lord is always there. He says, you can always come to me. That's where it starts. And he says, if you come to me, guess what I'm going to give you? Verse 28, I'm going to give you rest. And this is where we miss it. This is where we miss it. He says, I'm going to give you rest. This is, please don't miss this. This is where margin is missed all the time. It's like, it's like a miss. Because you do it, you come to him. You come to him, that's the right move, but you got the wrong motive. See, if you come to Jesus, he's going to give you what? And you're saying, but hold up, Lord. I ain't come to you for rest. I came to you for help. That's a little... That's, oh, just, just, just stay with me. Stay with me. I'll make it make sense. You want help. He wants to give you rest. What's the difference? See, when Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest... You're saying, thank you, Lord, and I'm much obliged and muchas gracias about the rest, but, but my daughter's got to go to cheerleading practice tonight, and I got to get my son. He's got karate t belt test, and, and then I still got to get dinner ready, and, 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 I, and also I got to prepare for my project tomorrow. I got to make a presentation. And then also, Lord, my spouse and I are supposed to have a conversation, an important conversation around finances, and I don't see how that's going to happen tonight because I don't even know if I'm going to approach the conversation with the right attitude because they don't even listen to me anyway, and so that's going to be a disaster. And then, Lord, you know I got a small group tonight. And what I'm hoping, Lord, also, oh, I forgot, I got the family, oh, we're doing a family Zoom tonight. The family is the family about Thanksgiving. We got a Zoom meeting to see who's doing what. And I was hoping I could jump on that Zoom while the kids were taking their baths. And God, you asked me, you trying to give me, uh, you trying to give me rest. I need help. Wait, 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 wait. You missed it. You missed it. See, it is your overcommitment that has you tired. You came to Jesus in verse 28. Go back. You came to Jesus in verse 28 for two reasons. You came because you was tired and you had a lot on you. That's the right thing to do. Bring it to Jesus. He says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. But you came to him for help because here's the truth. You really don't want to let go of the commitments. You don't want to let go of what got you tired because your reputation is tired, tied to what has you tired. And your self-worth is tied to what has you tired. And your people-pleasing ministry has you tied to what is tired, has you tired. <laughs> 
And because you don't want to let that go, because you want to let it go, you're saying, God, show me how to get it all done. And God says, no, I didn't, you don't get to do it on your terms. You need to ask me a different question because I didn't come to make, to tell you, to give you help in doing something I didn't tell you to do. A lot of the stuff that's on your schedule, I didn't put it on there. That's on your schedule because you're trying to impress everybody by having your children in all these different things. But I didn't tell you, ooh, y'all ain't ready for me today. I didn't tell you to do all that. So what you need to do is ask me three questions. What do I need to stop? What do I need to adjust? And what do I need to delegate? Let me say it to some people in Landover right now. What do I need to stop? What do I need to adjust? What do I need to delegate? S-A-D. Let me say it to somebody in Fort Washington right now. What do I need to stop? What do I need to adjust? What do I need to delegate? Elder McCorkle said that's S-A-D. That's sad. The reason why you're sad, because you won't stop, you won't adjust, you won't delegate. And you come to Jesus and say, please help me get stuff done that you never called me to do. That's not how it works. Ooh. He says, I'm trying to take stuff off your plate. So come to me, watch this, and I will give you rest. I'm not going to help you with your overcommitments. I want you to do this. I want you to take my yoke, take the yoke I have for you, verse 29, and put that on you. Ooh, take my yoke and put it on you. I got a custom-made yoke for you that's custom-made based on your abilities and your assignment. I would not put on you more than you can bear. Well, you say, Pastor, I know God called me to do that, and it's got me tired. I would suggest to you the reason why you're tired doing what he calls you to do is you're doing too many other things that's taking up all your energy and time and focus and attention so that when it's time to do what you're called to do, you're tired of doing that too. <laughs> Otherwise, he lied because he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I got a custom fit yoke for you. Your yoke is connected to your assignment. And many of, us, many of us are tired. Here's why. Because we're trying to fight David's battle with Saul's clothes on. So when David goes to fight Goliath, there's a story in the Bible where David, King David goes to fight. He ain't even a king at the time. He's a teenager. And he goes to fight Goliath. And the king at the time, who was Saul, says, if you're going to fight him, put this on. And David puts the man's stuff on. It doesn't fit him because it's not his yoke. It's not his stuff. David, <laughs> David fights with toys. <laughs> David got a, sling slot, sling, a slingshot, and he picks up stuff off the ground and fights with. Saul has all this custom armor. You know, he's got a designer sword and, and a vest, a Versace bronze vest, and he got all this coogee, and he got this stuff, and he put it on David, and David said, this don't even fit me. <laughs> And some of you are going to get your tail whooped in this life because you got on stuff that don't even fit you, but you put it on to try to fit in. <laughs> Jesus said, I got a custom yoke. He said, put this on. <laughs> put this on. And then, ooh, this is so good. When the yokes were made for oxen in the Bible, they were custom made. Each ox had a custom made yoke, but the yokes were made in two. So, so you know, oxen work together. They work in twos. They work in what? So, so even though the yoke is, is fit to this ox and that ox, they work together. They plow together. And when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, what he's saying is, I'm not only going to custom fit the yoke, but I'm a co-laborer with you. He says, now take my yoke on. I'm going to be, he says, I want us to be yoked up together. Yeah. Ooh, this is so good right here. You know what he's saying? Not only do I have an easy yoke for you, but I'm going to help you work it. Yeah. Woo! If I was at a Pentecostal church right now and I just said that, they would have got up and ran around the building. The organ would have been playing. They'd have threw money on the stage. Just on that right there. But I'm at Zion. I got it. You got to work hard over here. <laughs> Ain't that great news that Jesus said, whatever I've caused you to do, I won't just watch you do it. I'll do it with you. Let's get yoked up together. I can show you how to do accounting work. I can show you how to do engineering work. I can show you how to do hair. You knew when that head came in here, you ain't know what to do with that head. I can show you how to shape that head up. I can show you. There's nothing I've caused you to do. I can't show you how to do it. He says, I will co-labor co with you. Take my yoke upon you. And then watch the next thing he says. Because with Jesus, you're talking about a resource increase. How about this? I got an easy yoke and a light burden, and I got Jesus helping me do it. That's like a cheat code in a video game. And then he says, 
Next verse, next part of the verse, he says, and learn from me. I want to teach you too. What can we learn from Jesus? When I was a student at Washington Bible College, one of the presidents during my tenure there was a man named Dr. Harry Fletcher. And doc, I remember in chapel one time, Dr. Harry Fletcher said, he is baffled by the fact, he was baffled by the fact that in all his reading of scripture, he noticed that Jesus was never in a rush. And I was like, wow, that just hit me. Jesus never, so I tried to, you know, I'm, I'm like, that can't be true. But I can say that was in the 1980s to this day, I can't find anywhere in scripture where he was in a rush. Even when there was a storm on the water, he was walking in the storm on the water. Like, like there was a time when, when Jesus got a message, an urgent message. The message says, your, your friend Lazarus, whom you love, is sick and dying. He's terminally ill. Now, any one of us would have been like, hey, we got to get over there quick. We got to get there, get to his bedside before it's too late. Jesus didn't do anything. Didn't even move. He stayed where he was for two days. Then he walked to where Lazarus was, which is a two-day journey. He gets there four days after he gets the news, and the Bible says that when he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days, never in a rush, partly because his assignment was he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And what got me was that Jesus was never ripping and running. He, he, he moved with margin. He got a lot done without rushing. There's another story in the Bible where Jesus has a man named Jairus who comes to him and says, I got a daughter who's dying in my house. Could you please come to my house? Because my daughter is dying. Jesus says, sure, I'll come to your house. And he starts walking to the man's house. He's walking to the man's house and he's on the way to see about his daughter. He's not even rushing. And on his way to the man's house, the Bible says, there was a woman who had been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years who reached down from behind him and grabbed the hem of his garment. You know that story? Oh, if you knew these stories, it would be so good to you. Amen. You should just do, just Google it sometimes. And then, and then he reached, grabbed the hem of, hem of his garment and an issue that had played her for 12 years dried up. The power of God was so strong that it fixed something that she had spent 12 years, she had spent all her money trying to fix. And in one touch, ooh God, one touch from God, ooh, I don't even know who that's for. One move from God can change something you've been dealing with for 12 years. I ain't said that all day, but that's good news right there. One thing, one touch from God can turn something around after 12 years. So watch this. Jesus stops. He's walking, and the King James Version said he was thronged with people. That means people are surround, swarming him. So Jesus stops and said, who touched me? And his staff is like, Come on, Jesus, all these people out here, any, many, many more, man. It could have been anybody to touch you. He said, no, 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 there's a lot of people touching me, but somebody really touched me because they pulled power out of me. I know the difference. See, a lot of people had their hands up during worship, but I felt somebody, somebody was pulling on me when they was worshiping today. I know the difference. I know everybody's clapping. Somebody's clapping out of a place. Y'all in your I know that, I know, I know what kind of touch that was because power left me. So, so, so meanwhile, Jesus is talking about who touched me, and this man is saying, hey, hey, my daughter is dying, and we talking about who touched you. So Jesus finds out who touched him. He ministers to the woman, tells her she was embarrassed, but she got healed, and she's, he's told her, he gave her assurance about her future, about her healing, blessed her. Then he continues on, all right, let's go to your house. And the man had been waiting. Now, what that lets me know is, is because Jesus lived with margin, he had room for interruptions. <laughs> when, you don't have when you don't have any margin, you don't have room for interruptions. I don't have time for that. So he goes on. While he's moving now, some messenger from Jairus' house tells Jairus, it's too late, your daughter is dead. Don't even bother Jesus. And Jesus says to Jairus, not to the messenger. What I love about the Lord is, he's not talking to your haters, he's talking to you. He's, ooh, that's good. He says to Jairus, don't be afraid, keep believing. <laughs> and walked to the man's house and raised his daughter up from the dead and said, give her something to eat. I only shared those stories to just show you a point that Jesus was never in a rush. What's the point? If you want to know if you don't have margin or not, it is, it is, it is by this sign. You're always in a rush. Always overbooked. Always packing your schedule out with no, there's no break on your calendar. 
one meeting after another meeting after another meeting. So you're always running late because everything always runs over. So there's, and then you, here's another sign. You all, you, you, you don't leave where you need to leave on time early enough to arrive places promptly. So because you don't leave early enough, you drive like the devil's chasing you. So the whole trip is stressful. And how many of you ever noticed when you're in a rush, the people on the road are not in a rush? And so now you're pulling up on people's bumpers, giving them the finger, blowing the horn with Jesus saves on your bumper sticker. And you up there talking about with a Zion church, with a Zion track playing in the car. And you up there cussing people out because the devil got you because you don't have enough time because you don't have any margin. So when you operate like that, it's stressful. The whole thing is stressful. You forget stuff. It's easy to forget stuff because you got too much stuff to remember. Tell somebody one more time, you're doing too much. He says, learn from me. And here's what he says at the end of verse 29. He says, and you will find rest. He says in verse 28, if you come to me, I'm going to give you rest. That's peace in your soul. He says, but if you learn from me, you're going to find rest. It's a different rest. See, when you learn from me, you're going to start seeing where the rest is leaving you. If you learn from me and you slow down, you're going to start seeing all the areas where you're losing rest, where you're losing margin. You're going to find rest. But let me tell you how you're going to find it. Y'all ready? This is how you have to find rest. Most of our rest is being, is being swallowed up in two ways. Commitments and obligations. I'm going to talk about those two things and I'm done. Commitments and obligations is where most of our margin is being eaten up. We are over obligated, over committed. All those yeses is costing us now. All those you count me in is costing. All those, sure, I'll be there. No problem. My pleasure. It's costing you physical energy. It's costing you time. It's costing you your health. So now, instead of addressing the obligations and commitments, we're trying to figure out how to get it all done because we don't want to let anybody down. So here's what you have to, this is how you, this is the only way you can overcome it. You have to learn how to say no to keep yourself out of commitments and obligations. So all the people here that know you struggle with margin in your life, you got to say, you know what? I got to start getting in the rhythm of saying no to stuff because I'm already overloaded. Why would I add more? But this is good. Let me say something that's harder than that. Harder than saying no to a commitment you shouldn't go into is saying I'm sorry to a commitment you already made. And you say, you know what, y'all? I'm sorry, I done bit off more than I can chew. I'm not going to be able to continue. I really, I really love y'all, and I'm, but uh, you can blame me. You can say, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I go to this little, um, little spot. Um, yeah, man, little, you know, little dude, man. He was talking about margins, so, you know, and my old lady made me go. You know, she's your old lady when you're talking like, my old lady made me go, so I got, you know, they getting on me about my schedule and everything, man. You know, I really want to be there, but I'm sorry, I can't do it. See, some of you, it would kill you to get out of a commitment you shouldn't have never been in. When you signed up for it, you had all good intentions. You said, I'll be the team, Mom. You thought it was a budget. You are the budget. You done bought all the Gatorade. You done bought all the snacks. You done did all the scheduling. You on staff. Ain't nobody working harder than you. You know what you got to say? I'm so sorry. I... I bit off more than I can chew. I can recommend somebody else that may be able to help. In fact, I may need to be a group of people who does this if you want me to recommend, but I'm not going to be able to continue. You, you'd be surprised at how many people are sick to your stomach to even think, like, I like to keep my promise. I like to keep my promise. You're going to be dead. And the promise you're making is not even to the people who matter most. We ain't, even talk, we ain't even talking about your tribe. We talking about your fraternity and sorority people. I'm sorry, y'all. I don't mean to mess, message y'all Greek people. We, we talking about people 
that's not even your assignment. And you are obligated. And I'm saying if you don't learn how to unobligate yourself, you will never recapture your margin. I said this before. And people are going to line up with your funeral and talk about how great and committed you were. And I'm not saying everybody's not going to die. Everybody's going to die. I get that. But it's not just the quantity of life. It's the quality of life. And your body will tell you when you're overwhelmed, stress. Impatience with the people in my house because I got to be so nice to these people that I ain't even supposed to be on this board. But your image is tied to that board. Woo. I must just be talking to myself. I'm just here. Y'all just eavesdropping. I'm just walking around here with a mirror just talking to myself. (laughs) Write this down. Write this down. A request is not a requirement. (laughs) A request is respect. I'm going to say it again. A request is not a requirement. A request is respect. See, we automatically assume that a request is a requirement. Well, they asked me. So what? You know what they ask you? They respect you. They know what you bring to the table. And you know why they respect you? They respect you because of your yoke, your assignment. They respect who you are and what you do best. But if you keep treating every request like it's a requirement, you won't have the time or the energy to do what made them respect. Ooh, y'all missed that. Because you everywhere but there. Every ask is not an obligation. You say, I can't. I would love to, but I can't. I just can't pull it off. I was in a meeting. I'm going to close with this talking about impatience and one of the people in the meeting was just talking about technology and AI and he talked about how he has a car. You talk about (laughs) impatience. He has a car that he can, from his phone, summon his car to drive to where he is, sit in front of the door with the temperature set the way he wanted to be, wants it to be when he gets in the vehicle and the music playing that he wants to hear. That's from his phone. So he can talk to his car from his phone and give it that kind of direction. Y'all know that's really possible. This person wasn't lying. And I said, see, see, because what happens is our busyness has got us all the accoutrements we ever wanted. Our busyness got us a bag. Our busyness got us cars like that. Our busyness got us homes that we wanted to live in. Our busyness got it. We ain't just in the frat or so. We in the boule. <laughs> you in the boule. And so our busyness got us all of the accoutrements, but it's cost us what mattered most. So you're able to talk to your car from your phone, but you can't talk to your child in your house. <laughs> 